Well, it feels so good to be here this morning and to think I'm going to be speaking first. I think I actually should be very nervous, which I am, and I think that's allowed, right? Okay, so thank you very much because um, looking at these faces, I'm very confident of the fact that I'm not just here to speak. I'm here to share this idea that we both feel resonates with us and together I believe we're going to pick out the points and leave this room acting on it, making the world a better place even as much as we want to. Okay, so um, I'm a very proud African, I must mention. And I would just like to see how many of us are just as are proud are, about Africa as I am. How many of us? Okay, I think this is a good number. So I'm specifically very proud of Nigeria. <laughs> and a part of me is wondering if I should risk this social experiment. But why not? How many of us are proud to be Nigerians? <laughs> Okay, so I think that's very understandable, right? The fact that every time we wake up in this country, we have to think about so many things that have made things difficult for us. To think that a number of children in their millions are out of school, to think that a lot of people do not have access to health care, to think that potable water is even a problem in several communities in Nigeria. And to even think that with all of our efforts, either in the for profit or the non profit profit industry, we feel it's a bit much more difficult to other communities where people are getting things done. This is, the, this is also like the kind of bias, the kind of mindset I had. Like, why must everything be so difficult? So let me ask you this question. What is the biggest problem that hurts your heart about Nigeria? What is that biggest problem? <laughs> okay, and why do you think that problem exists? Why exactly do you think that problem exists? So for many of us, our big why is obvious. And it's because we believe that there are a group of people who have failed us repeatedly. We think that every time we've handed power over to some group of people, whether our employers or the government, or a group of people we've just trusted at one point or the other to lead us, it's as if it comes back hurting us. And this is the mindset that have kept a lot of people from wanting to participate in anything that does not bring financial reward. The fact that your bills must be paid, and if you don't pay them yourself, who is going to do that? The fact that you don't even have enough time to put all things together and get things done, and yet someone wants you to do something without financial reward, it really brings the question of who really is responsible for the causes of the social inequalities we have? A part of me wants to blame the generation right before me, right? Because I believe to a large extent, these people were here when a lot of things were going haywire. Why did they not ask the people they had put in charge? Why didn't they ask them for what they were doing? Why didn't we hold them responsible? Another part of me is like, maybe I'm also very much involved. And I think this is the truer part. So it is bad enough that nature in itself always tries to marginalize the weak people amongst us. Even the law of natural selection, right? It tells us that we are going to do survival of the fittest. And then it's just being the question, do we keep letting the status quo be the way it is? Do we keep letting nature actually kick out the weak ones amongst us? And what if, just what if, Following the law of natural selection, the universe also decides to kick out the planet Earth that you and I have weakened. Do you see why we can't leave things to be the way they are? So over the years, we've seen a lot of innovations rising from startups in the healthcare, in the fintech, in the education industry, all trying to address the root causes of social inequalities. And in the real sense, in the early stages of startups, sustainability is very key. And Many times, it means just targeting those who are able to afford them. Because if you don't keep your cash flow running, how else are you going to remain in business in the early stages of startups? So without or with bias, these social innovations just can't get to the people at the grassroots. Also, recently on the Nigerian Twitter, we can see people raising brows at the rates of rights of charities. Many people have the opinion that if you feel you have one extra money somewhere you don't need, everybody is starting charities. And for one reason or the other, we just feel this doesn't work well with us. We've also questioned please, in the government telling us about policies that they are trying to put in place in order to solve the problem of social inequalities. And you and I, as professionals in our field, are also working endlessly to get things done. But why are things just not getting done? Like, why? 
why you wake up in the morning, you come here, you mix some chemicals in the laboratory in the hopes that you're going to innovate something that is going to make the quality of life better. You wake up in the morning, the today's food organizers volunteered to put these events together in the hopes that something is going to get done. But at the end of the day, why is it that we have so much effort but then limited things to show for it? Why? Just why? I think the first thing we need to understand and establish is that you and I are very culpable. Social inequalities in itself is a pang of collective guilt. We contributed our worrisome bits. And if there is anything that is going to change that, it must also be out of the same interest with which we've contributed that we are stepping out of our way to get it solved. The concept of love basically believes that you do things for the people that really matters to you without expecting anything in return. And volunteerism in itself is the language of love in the society. P perhaps, I understand to believe it that the more we stand up with the mindset of solving problems, expecting a reward, because we are not speaking that sole language of the goodwill, I think the more is really going to address this, it's going to be to address this problem of social inequalities in itself. I might have the picture of a man who really wants to have everything get done, right? So this man is for was fortunate enough to be able to get money, so he literally believes he doesn't need love. So he got people to be able to buy him food, wash his clothes, do a lot of things. But then he realizes that there is a significant thing that is missing in his life. And at each point, he realizes that there is one part of it. Everyone is doing everything and is living fine. But the particular element of love is missing. Am I saying we can't use money to buy love? Am I saying we can't use money to buy love? Maybe we can use money to incentivize it. But then, love in itself simply wants us to do things for him because we choose to do it. Volunteerism and its butterfly effects. And by butterfly effects, I mean that the fact that by doing our own little quarter, we're able to produce a very, very great effect. And it's the same thing with love. You've seen great men who at the end of the day want to tell their story. They come and talk to you about there has been one person that they believe in, whether it's human or not a human. They tell you there is one desire that has kept them in achieving everything they want to, and that is love. When you talk, think about it, just one person in the billions of people in the world really motivated them to do everything they did and it's changed and significantly affected all the greatness you see. That is the butterfly effect of love. You don't need the whole world to love you. you. Just need that one person that matters to love you. The same way, the society is not calling us to solve all of its problems. They just need those few people that really care about it to solve the problem from the place of goodwill. So even though you have a social innovation in your mind, it's a very good contribution. But then, perhaps social inequalities would not respond to it because you have not spoken his love language, goodwill. So ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of misconceptions about volunteerism. The first is that volunteerism is for the less busy. In fact, it's even very difficult to be very busy and step out to want to volunteer for things. That's because even if you go out and get it done, you're still going to come back here and all of the things you need to do will still be there waiting for you. Am I right? Like, literally, it feels like nobody is going to get it done. But let's look at examples of people who, despite being very busy, have weaponized the tool of volunteerism in creating change. So, you look at most successful places where we have less social inequalities. Look at the US, look at the UK. I'm talking about relative examples now, not in themselves holistic. But look at the US, look at the UK. Maybe we even talk about the history of South Africa and realize that one thing is common. For every leader that has fought their way to an equitable society, there was the goodwill that was not backed by financial reward. Whether it's democracy or it's monarchy, or, or, or it is a benevolent dictatorship. There is the element of goodwill that has backed every form of actions they have put in place. And that's why we cannot solve the problems of social inequalities with incentives like financial reward. We just can't. 
Because the more we even try to put financial rewards, the more we widen the gap. In Nigeria, we complain a lot about what our politicians do. We say they earn a lot of money and more. If really financial reward is what drives change, if really paying people to solve this problem is what works, why are we not having the top countries where their leaders are paid to do the best things, having the most equitable societies? Money is not the love language the society wants us to tell him in solving social inequalities. No. No form of incentive is required of us, except the true love language of stepping aside from the thing that really mattered. And I'm not saying you are not contributing to social good by staying and doing the things in your career. I'm just saying that that itself is self-fulfilling. And it does not speak to inequality. The more you pay a person to save to solve a problem, maybe you want to talk, solve the problem of poverty, and you pay a group of people to solve this problem, do you realize how you are further widening the income gap between that person and the solution you are trying to provide? So ladies and gentlemen, we have established that, first of all, social inequalities exist, and there's nothing we can do about it if we do not love and step out of our ways to get this done. So what next? What next? So we have a lot of developers, right? We have a lot of people who are very skilled, but really feel whenever they want to volunteer, the skill they have is not what they really want to volunteer, right? So maybe you've, um, you are, you, you are, uh, uh, and you've gotten to the peak of your career, or maybe you're a student and you're still trying to gain knowledge to be able to solve the problems that you have seen. Maybe that's even why you're studying the course you're trying to study. Like, after gaining all of this, what next? You've been paid to do it. Yes, people pay you in return, but what next? The big thing that is next is that, understand that, just as you are not paid to be a part of the problem, you can't be paid to solve the problem. And how have you been a part, either by being the originator, being the perpetrator, or even believing it, because it dwells primarily in the heart. And that's why I strongly believe that the goodwill that also comes primarily from the heart is the tool to unwind the key, the, the locks that have closed the bars of social inequalities on us. So we see a lot of celebrities really buying into this idea of volunteerism. They're missing their social capital. You see them associate, you see them associating with inequalities like climate change, like gender, like healthcare, and a whole lot. But we really need more people, especially in the field of academia and research, to step out of the classroom and laboratory walls. Problem does not end there. In fact, all innovations are supposed to thrive in the society. So how can you volunteer? How can you participate? Giving your time? No. But how about giving credibility to the people promoting, the, promoting solutions to the inequalities in your area? So in my recent interactions with Dr. Mobala Johnson, Dr. Kenny Lama, who are like the founders of the Nigerian University of Technology and Management, and also some, um, so, um, also, ministers in this country sometimes they go. These people strongly believe in the concept of moving from success to significance. Success, significance. So success is that stage where you are able to have all of your mismates. You've achieved career goals. And to be frank, your works have really produced effects that have helped life. But significance talks about the impact you have significantly made while achieving your career goals. Why living your life? Why achieving success? Is it enough to just be successful? Or is it enough to be significant? Is it enough to have all your needs met? Or is it enough? Or is it better to be loved by one person you know will never compromise in that love? Which would you choose? So I'm going to close with a personal story. So they did some introductions and they like formulate this and formulate that. All right. 
But yes, yeah, sometimes in 2018, I became more aware about the social inequalities that existed in my environment, right from my childhood, human rights to the university environment. I was particularly drawn to the systemic failures that existed in the healthcare industry. For me, I wonder why do people really need to have to choose between health and wealth? And we bamboozle ourselves saying health is wealth. No, health and wealth. And then we see a lot of people struggling to make the decision between health or wealth. And in the process, they lose their lives to the bargain. And then you will see many more people in the midst of abundance still suffering from access to healthcare because of simple systemic flaws, such as the ease of access. So, I was just in my third year, and it could have appeared very obvious how limited I could be in solving this problem. The thing that a broke student who had no job <laughs> was going to be solving a problem in healthcare was like one of the most alarming things for me. Man, I was broke. <laughs> but then, what really happened? And how did I choose that? Maybe this should not be the decision to step down. I started speaking to a couple of friends, and in no time, we were planning our first outreach. It was supposed to be a beggar's health outreach that we're going to hold around the community hall. We wanted to extend some love to some street beggars, and um, by secondary effects, we wanted to like, empower those that were still able amongst them. Perhaps that would be a more lasting solution to the problem, right? But you can ask me about it. It failed. Like, nah. So you see, the problem sometimes is that we notice problems that we associate with and that exist within our vicinity. But when we are trying to solve this problem, we look for a similar group of people who have this problem. Or maybe they don't even have the problem, but because we perceive them to be more impactful, when the stories are told, we believe they are the right set of people we should really be working with. And in the real sense, we can't relate with them. Charity, they say, begins at home. Home. So, my dear friend, if your friend has a social innovation, don't look for a pay stack to go and volunteer with. You believe this idea, then you really should stay with it because that's the language of love. It doesn't deserve you. You just believe it. So, very quickly, what is volunteerism not? Volunteerism is not about being the Messiah. No. No messianic complex here. In fact, if all the messiahs that have been self-acclaimed really were messiahs, the world would have been the best place to live. And that's why I call it the butterfly effect. Because what really matters is your little contribution and the ripple effect that it really brings. And if you try to form the messiah, you'll be rushing and rush out. That's the simple thing. You would rush in, you would rush out. There is a need for resil resilience in every of the things we are doing. First of all, especially because in this community, honestly, if we want to be rational, it doesn't, it feels like it doesn't deserve us. It doesn't deserve to really, we should do anything that wouldn't bring us gain. Another thing that volunteerism is not, is self-fulfilling goals. If your primary reason for volunteering is because you want to gain a skill, you feel it's going to improve your professional, um, your professional CV and more, I would rather advise you to go and look for an unpaid internship because that is going to benefit you more. One thing that volunteerism is, is the goodwill to step out of your way and solve the problem. And until we speak the la love language of social inequalities, which is volunteerism, we really can't solve this problem. So by 2019, I'd identified two groups of people with whom I was closely um, associated. One was my childhood community, and the other is the university environment. At the time, I was one of the first set of healthcare students that we had in Futa, um, specifically then studying human anatomy. So this, by virtue of my background, meant that I was also a medical leader in the eyes of many Futarians, because obviously we were the best we had in the medical line. So I decided to start um, helping a group of friends and colleagues in 
checking their blood pressure, checking their blood sugar, and a couple of things like that. And it was really surprising when um, I realized the number of people, young persons who really had high blood pressure, who really had high blood sugar, but we're not aware. And we could have kept all in the deception that we young people never really find out. The failure we had taught me really to come back home and think about the people with whom I associate with their struggles. And we took it one day at a time. Like today, when I think about it, the fact that this same kind of like, set of beggars really wanted to care for some time ago had the same set of people that our volunteers are now caring for operational in five states, over 2,500 lives in rural and urban communities impacted, and we are building our first healthcare system from the guard up in rural communities. It really just teaches me about the fact that if you don't associate with this, don't try to struggle with it, don't try to solve it. You can build a professional career anywhere by hearing about it, but you cannot volunteer anywhere because you just heard about it. Volunteer Build a career in global change, like in climate change, it's very good. Build a career in medicine, it's very good. But the social inequality at your heart may just be that one child that, that lived beside you all through the 10 years of staying together but never had the opportunity to go to school. And that's the difference between career and volunteerism. The fact that you step out of your way to really not address that thing that you've either been a part of or not been a part of. And the truth is really nobody is going to pay you to solve it because nobody really pays you to love. In the end, I just hope that we see the fact that volunteerism isn't something that you should be talked to do. It's something that really should come out of your goodwill. Because the moment you start being sweet, talked into heat, then perhaps it's losing its meaning. The moment you start looking to build your CV through heat, perhaps it's losing its meaning. The moment you start seeing it as a burden, perhaps it's losing its meaning. Because love doesn't really bear any of those things in heart. So I challenge you to choose to challenge the inequalities that break your heart. To stop seeing it as a distant problem caused by a group of people. To stop seeing it as your career line. To stop seeing it as the thing that is going to be your jackpot in the future. But simply, like the way you will love that one person you want to spend the rest of your life with, solve the problem. Thank you.